I'm going to start. I'm how, how are you, Gail? I'm good. I just spent the past 25 minutes trying to get on. So I apologize about keeping everybody waiting. Well, is that my fault? Because there's been a few people who have had. Same, same here. Yeah. It, normally, when I click on a link, it just takes me to Zoom. But this made me sign in. It made yeah. me authenticate things. Um, I had to put in my password. I had to do all sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, it made it a little more difficult to get in. Definitely. I don't know if that's the way it's being set up, Keith, to enter the meeting. but. Normally, no. As a matter of fact, I always set them up the same. I don't know what happened. Uh, maybe I did click a different button or something, uh, because normally I just set them all up the same. I've got many of them set up, and um, I, I see these things come in from Zoom all the time, like we're changing this, we're changing that. I'm not saying it's them, but maybe um, I will look into it. There, there are quite a few people who have not gotten in who um, should be here. So my apologies to everyone on that. Um, well, uh, and I'm just glad to know I'm not the only one. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we'll just blame it on Zoom. They're not here to defend themselves. No, so. no, 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 no. We don't blame it on Zoom. We blame it on Keith. <laughs> <laughs> oh you know michael and i go way back we've never met but i feel like we have <laughs> that's true <laughs> uh well listen let's let's get this kicked off because of timing i am so sorry gail i don't know what happened um you know, typically for some of you who are new to to this meeting, the Stroke Awareness Oregon's uh, Stroke Survivor Meetings, I promise that I'll get it figured out so it's not so tough to get on here uh, in the future. But um, uh, I just want to thank you guys for, you know, staying consistent, trying to figure it out and getting in here. I uh, really appreciate it. I was a little worried in the beginning because, you um, you know, as we got started, Jim came on and no one else is, was popping on. And usually we have quite a few folks. So, uh, but there is, we are recording this, so we'll get it out to everybody. And then I'll, uh, I'll put a, an apology together for, and try to figure things out as we go. Um, one thing I like to say is, as we have our, our speaker, Gail is going to speak with, with us here. And uh, one thing I like to do is remind everybody to raise your hand if you have a question or, you know, or do something so that we don't always interrupt one another. Uh, that can happen in a, a meeting like this. And so we try to um, just ask you to raise your hand. And, and then I also like to keep it to where it's three, sometimes up to five minutes long uh, that you can talk about different things that you might want to say. Michael? Well, I think it's important that we keep this meeting off with Gail telling us what concert she went to. Yeah, so Gail, you you missed it. We uh, in the event of you know gaining some time, uh, Michael had the idea of what what was your first concert ever. So I guess you're on the spot now. Oh my God, I love it. So. And I have a distinct recollection of this, and you'll understand why when I tell you who I first saw. <laughs> I saw the village people as my oh. first. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I, oh, that does give me some sense of a, a vision, Gail. <laughs> yes, I mean, that definitely stands out for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, well, Michael, we appreciate you getting that started for us as well. So that helped out. So I'm going to get right into it. Gail uh, Flans is a stroke coordinator with, is it Bethesda? Yep. Bethesda, Bethesda yep. Hospital in South Florida. Um, she was introduced to us by Michelle up there. Hi. <laughs> And uh, Michelle had been to a meeting or two of hers and loved her and loved the, the stuff that she had to share. And 
then Gail and I have communicated back and forth a few times. And um, she recently went to the, is it the stroke, what stroke coordinator? No, stroke, international was, stroke conference. That was it. Exactly, yes. And she's gonna share some things uh, about that with us. And um, we just wanna say welcome, Gail. And it's pretty low key, as you can tell. Uh, but we just love to hear from you and off we go. Thank you, Keith. And hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Thanks so much for having me on. I always um, cherish every opportunity that I have to talk about stroke and just if there's any one thing that I can say to help change people's lives or to help make somebody better off, um, I'm all about that. So what I wanted to bring to everybody's attention today was as he said, I'm the stroke coordinator at Bethesda Hospital. I've been in that role actually um, since 2005. So I've been doing this for quite a while and we run our own support groups down here. And um, some of what I wanted to bring to the group was some of the latest updates, because I'm sure a lot of information you might've heard already. So I wanted to try to bring to the table some of the newer things that you might not have heard yet and some of the things that they were talking about at the International Stroke Conference this past year in Dallas. Um, so I'm gonna see if I can share my screen with you guys. I'm doing this from my phone for the first time with the difficulties I had logging on. So I'm gonna see if I can make this work. Um, Let's see. Keith, it's only, only you can share. So if you're able to disable that and let me share, I'll be able to pull up, I think I'll be able to pull up my PowerPoint. Right. And hope. All right, let's see. Okay. Yep, so let's see if I can bring this up for you guys. Oh, sorry, good timing, right? My phone is ringing. <laughs> um, okay, that's not it. <laughs> Let me see. Um, just bear with me one sec. I know I'll be able to find it eventually. Sorry about that. You're going to hear my dad leaving me a message in the background. Um, I had to kind of switch techniques here to be able to um get on and um i'm not used to making it work this way so let's see what we can do in terms of getting to the powerpoint that i had pulled up for you guys let's see if we can do it this way And if not, I'll just be able to talk to you guys, but I always like to try to do something visual if we can. I always find that I'm a very visual person too, so I find that works best, but let's see if we can pull it up. Um, Okay, do you guys see it up there now? Do you see the stroke update 2023? No. Oh, you don't see it? No. Okay, sorry, bear with me. Let me see what I can do here to try to get that to you guys. Are you seeing 
I guess you don't see anything yet that in terms of my screen, eh? It's, no. Um, okay. All right, I know we can make this work. Did anybody not share what concert they went to while we're waiting? <laughs> or did everybody do that already? So no, I didn't. Uh, and the reason is uh, the rules were not to talk about stroke. And I actually can't really do that in answer that question because before my stroke, I really didn't enjoy listening to music a lot. So I actually never went to a concert in my entire life. <laughs> wow. Wow. And one of the really strange uh, effects of my stroke is that I uh, now enjoy listening to music a lot more. <laughs> my first concert in that sense was like <laughs> just about a year ago. Uh, I went to see a, a, it was actually the Des Moines Symph Symphony Orchestra with a band playing the music of Queen. Oh, that's oh good. cool. Uh, really, uh, yeah. Very it's good. healing. It's healing. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Mark, how old were you when you had your stroke? I was 53. Yeah. Yeah. Now, have you been in the States the whole time? No. Uh, I came to the States in uh, 1991. Okay. 90, 1990. Yeah, you know, I don't know what it is. I mean, one of my therapists said it might be a, a like right brain, left brain thing because music is mostly in the right brain. Mm. But and I haven't really found anybody else had that had that experience. Mm. But uh, it's weird. Yeah. Uh, let me ask Bevan and and Angela. Did you guys have trouble getting in? Yeah, yeah. a little, a little bit. Yeah, uh, I had a. I don't know what happened. Um, I'll work on that for next time. I apologize for the problems that everybody's had to get in, but it's been it's been a challenge for sure. So uh, I don't know if it was a Zoom thing, I, frankly, um, or if it was my doing. But uh, either way, we'll get it worked on and fixed up. Here. Well, well, I was thinking for me that I haven't been on Zoom in such a long time, so maybe things changed on my account. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, let's hear your concert, Keith. My first concert. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, you know, I I was sitting here driving myself crazy because I can't remember their name. Uh, uh, they sound a lot like Toto, but it wasn't. Um, Steve, they sang that song. Uh, Jane. Oh yeah, Starship. Starship, Jeff yeah. Starship. Good one. <laughs> yeah, they, were, they had a lot of good songs. And then I I ended up going and and watching the Scorpions, uh, <laughs> right after that actually, and that was a wild experience. <laughs> uh, like Steve, I mean, not like Steve, but I played. I played. I played in a lot. I played of in a lot of band band stuff too. Stuff too. But it was. Uh, but it was uh, crazy time. Crazy time. Hey, uh, Keith. Uh, for Mark, uh, I used to really enjoy music before my stroke, and I don't find it as enjoyable now. Hmm. So I have the opposite effect. So, and I, yeah, I don't yeah. know why. Yeah, it's just yeah, weird. It's just weird. Mm hmm personalities change i've noticed mm. some things i like now i didn't like back before i had my stroke just different interests guess it depends on where the stroke hits in your brain yeah i think that's right Hi, how you doing gail are, are we okay to talk for a second or yeah i mean i'm sorry i'm stumped you guys i so I sincerely apologize because oh, um, I'm is. able to see it. There it is. Yeah. There's your phone anyway. Your phone. My phone now? Okay. So let me see if I can get back to the document then. Um, 
It's your cat. <laughs> yes, that is my cat. That's Chewy. <laughs> One of my lifesavers. Um, and now I'm trying to see where I can get back to where I had the PowerPoint up. So, because I don't have, because I had to switch devices to get in, I don't have PowerPoint downloaded on my phone. So that's part of the issue here, but I was able to pull it up through my email. But when I try to access it again, so, but you guys, um, yeah, let me see if we can, if it'll work. All right, do you see it up there? Yes. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was seriously tested there, but um, thank you guys for bearing with this whole thing. Um, I hope this will be worth it after you hear the information that I have to present. Um, but thank you so much for your patience and for bearing with me. So with that said, because we're um, already halfway through your meeting, um, I won't waste any further time, but just all to just for anybody that might have been new logging in, I'm going to present information that I thought um, would be worthwhile to you guys from, from a per community perspective, from the International Stroke Conference, which is a big deal in the stroke world. Everybody from different countries and all over the place are there um, attending the latest and greatest new information with stroke. So I wanted to bring that to you, to the table and update you with some of the newer happenings. Some of the information I'm sure you've heard already, but some you might not have. So with the, the ones that you've heard already, hopefully it'll be a nice refresher, but we'll see um, what you guys think. Hopefully um, you'll get something out of the information. So one of the things that's not new is Life's Essential 7. Has anybody heard of this before? Yes. Okay, great. Anybody that hasn't? I, I haven't. haven't. I haven't. Okay, good. It's good to know that some of this information might be new. So the Life's Essential 7, what that is, are essential things that everybody should be doing, especially after a stroke, but in any day, regular activities, everyday living to make sure that you have these specific things in mind to lead a healthy lifestyle. So you hear all the time, people talk about blood pressure. You want your blood pressure to be less than 180 over, 120 over 80. I preface this by the way, with saying, this is all general information. Some people might be okay at a lower blood pressure versus higher. You wanna check with your doctor about anything specifically related to you. But in general, the target blood pressure that they're looking at is 120 over 80. Anything that starts creeping up, especially over 130, is, can, can be considered problematic and something that you wanna get checked out. So you wanna know what your blood pressure is and you wanna make sure that it's something that you pay attention to because all these things could play a part when you're talking about increasing the risk of stroke increasing the risk of heart attack, mortality, that type of thing. When you're talking about cholesterol, so the number there is for the total cholesterol, you want your total cholesterol to be less than 200. In the stroke world, what we look at a lot and what a lot of people might not be familiar with is the LDL. So your lower density lipids, you have your HDL and your LDL, you've heard maybe the term good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. The LDL is the bad cholesterol. So you want that to be lower. And what you're looking at is not just the total cholesterol to be less than 200, but you want your LDL to be less than 70 if you have any cardiovascular risk factors. So if you've had a stroke, if you've had a heart attack, anything like that, especially, you want your LDL to be below 70. And that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily pay attention to. They just look at the overall number. You want to look at your LDL as well. Another thing that you want to pay attention to is your blood glucose. Okay. So even if you're not diabetic, you want to make sure that prediabetes isn't creeping up on you. And you want to make sure that your sugar levels are under control. And for that, what they look at is a blood 
glucose level of less than 100. When you get your regular checkups, when you visit with the doctor, make sure you're looking at these numbers and that you pay attention to them and know what they mean. Body weight, so that's your BMI. You might've heard that before, your body mass index. This is something to look at too in terms of leading a healthy lifestyle. They want your BMI to be less than 25 kilograms per, per milligram squared, okay? So when you see your body mass index and basically what that is, is a function of your height and weight and your circumference and they look at all types of things like that, you wanna make sure that your BMI is less than that number there. You wanna maintain a heart healthy diet, okay? So DASH diet or the Mediterranean diet, something that is, has a lot of fish in it, grains, vegetables, a lot of green in there. Those are the type of things you wanna pay attention to to leading a healthy style. In terms of stroke diet, they often talk about low salt, low fat. That's something that you want to pay attention to as well. All right. You want to make sure that you're not adding a lot of salt to your food, that if you have a piece of chicken, for instance, you don't eat the skin. You don't want that fatty type of um, component to be in there. You want to modify what you eat. You don't have to cut it out altogether, but just watch what you do in a normal intake and on a regular basis, everything in moderation. Physical activity, um, the recommended lifestyle when it comes to that is some, doing something about three times a week minimum. So three to five times a week is great. A minimum of half an hour a day and something that's gonna get your heart rate up, all right? So if you're doing something that really you don't feel like you're sweating at all or you don't feel like your heart is beating a little bit faster, not really the type of exercise that's going to prevent heart attacks and, and strokes. You want to make sure that you do something that is going to get your heart racing a little bit, not over the top, but something that you're going to really feel like it's a workout. So if you're doing the same walk every day, for instance, and it's no longer taxing and you don't feel like it's making you work out at all, you want to either increase the amount that you're doing walk a little bit faster, do something where you really feel like you're getting your blood pump in a little bit. All right. And the other thing when they talk about life's essential seven is no smoking. It's never too late to quit, by the way. So there's a lot of people I know out there that think oh, I've already smoked for 50 years. If I continue for another few years, it's not going to do any damage. It really does. And it's never too late to stop. They've seen studies of people who have smoked for many, many years of their lives and they stop smoking and you can see three months later, six months later, a year later, the difference in their lungs. So it really does make a difference even later on in life. You want to try to get rid of any habits like that that are going to put you more at risk. So that's Life's Essential 7. What was new at the Stroke Conference is they introduced an eighth element to this. So aside from, hold on. Okay, so we now have Life's Essential 8. So can anybody guess, what do they think that component that's so important to prevent strokes, heart attacks, any type of cardiovascular event like that, Anybody can guess what that, what other that other drink more water. Ooh, that's a great guess, but it's, it's not actually that, but that's also very important. You want to make sure you stay hydrated. But that's quality, when they ask. quality sleep. Very good. Who said that? Jim Patterson. Very good, Jim. Did you know that beforehand or did you guess? Uh, I did it as a result of my life experience. <laughs> All right. So you had an experience where you looked into it or you needed to get more sleep? Well, I, I realized after going through sleep study, that was one of the issues I had that, that uh, led to my stroke. Ah, uh, yeah. So very, very important. So thank you, Jim, for sharing that. So the, as Jim said, Life's essential eight, the last component that got added now is sleep. 
it's very important to get a good night's rest. And what they're finding is that it's equally as important as the things I just mentioned. So when you talk about high blood pressure, you talk about cholesterol, you talk about glucose, all those things that you often see associated with a stroke, and that is really things that they want you to control. They also want you to get enough sleep so that you can prevent a stroke or heart attack or anything like that from happening. Hmm. So what's the recommended amount? Anybody have any idea on that? Is it over seven? Exactly. Seven seems to be the magic number. Um, so for some people, the more sleep they get, the better. They do say too, if you're like me and, um, you don't get a lot of sleep necessarily during the week, but you binge sleep over the weekend that you can catch up on your sleep during the weekend too. So that does help mm. getting regular amounts of sleep every night is more beneficial, of course, but if you do also catch up over the weekend and spend more time sleeping, the total amounts of sleep that you get per, per week is also beneficial and not just every night. So you, you can catch up on your sleep a little bit. Hmm. So I wanted to mention that to make sure that people knew because we often, you know, don't take care of ourselves properly, you know, and we often put off things and make sure that we want to get everything done and pack so many things into a day. You definitely do want to make sure that you get enough sleep. It, you know, that's why they say that newborns sleep so much. It's a restorative type of process. They're processing everything that they, that they are integrating into their minds. Um, it has a lot of healing powers and a lot of restorative powers. So you want to make sure you do get enough sleep. So blood pressure. Um, this is really important. Um, I mentioned this as part of Life's Essential 7 is one of the main things that they talked about. And what I want to make sure that I mention is I see often that blood pressure is not checked properly. So that can really affect your readings. And I shared an article with my group at one point in time that demonstrated that if a blood pressure cuff is too small or too large, for instance, you can get either readings that are too high or too low. So if, if the readings came back and they were lower than what they really should be, people weren't being treated appropriately because the doctor felt their blood pressure was normal when in fact it wasn't. Um, or people might have an erroneously high reading where they were placed on blood pressure medicine when they didn't need to be. And it was all related to the blood pressure size of the cuff. So something to consider and something to make sure too, not just the cuff, but when you're getting your blood pressure checked. So I don't know if any of you have your own blood pressure machines at home. I know with the groups that I deal with, several people have been told by their, their, their doctors that they want um, them to check their blood pressures regularly. You want to make sure you're checking it correctly, either at home or when a doctor is checking it. Because trust me, I've seen a lot of offices that just don't spend the time sometimes to make sure that it's done correctly. So what we're looking out for, okay, before you get your blood pressure checked, you shouldn't be doing any type of strenuous activity about 30 minutes beforehand. So you wanna make sure that you get there within enough time, you're not stressing to get there, you're not rushing to the doctor's office, anything like that is gonna elevate your blood pressure. You don't want to, if you are a smoker, which I strongly recommend that you're, you shouldn't be, but in case you are, you want to make sure you're not smoking prior to getting your blood pressure checked. That will affect your reading. Also caffeine. So if you have a coffee beforehand, if you have an early morning appointment and you have um, a shot of Joe to wake you up in the morning, that's going to affect your reading. So you want to pay attention to that and make sure that you're not doing those type of things beforehand. Okay. And, and no exercise, like I mentioned, nothing strenuous beforehand. So don't run up the stairs, you know, and then go get your blood pressure checked. So you want to be able to sit still for at least five minutes before you get any type of reading like that. All right, and let's see. During things that you want to pay attention to, make sure the cuff is the right size, as I mentioned, okay? So 
Um, if you are taking it at home, I have um, a chart that I'll pull up for you guys that you can see a little bit um, if you are actually using the right size or not, but something to think about. And when you're at a doctor's office in the hospital, make sure they're not using a cuff that is too large or, or too small for you. You wanna make sure that you also keep your arm flat on a surface, okay? Either up on the table like you see here in this picture or just laying in your lap, you wanna make sure that it's nice and in a resting type of position. You also wanna make sure you're sitting upright, your back is against the chair, and you don't wanna have your feet crossed, all right? So pay attention to that too. A lot of people will cross their feet just out of normal sitting pattern. If your feet are crossed, that's also gonna affect your blood pressure. So you wanna make sure that your feet are flat on the floor and you don't wanna talk. So doctor's office especially, they love asking you questions as they're putting the blood pressure uh, machine while they have it because they're, they're multitasking. The problem with that is it will affect your reading. So you wanna make sure that, especially if you're looking at tweaking medication or you really need to pay attention to an accurate reading, you wanna make sure that you're not talking during the process. Okay, and what about after? They say to wait one minute and then retake your blood pressure. So they actually tell you to take an average of three readings if you can, that's gonna give you the most accurate results. And if you are taking it at home, keep a log, make sure that you enter it on a regular basis, that you don't skip any, um, that you don't miss any. And um, it's a good idea that if you do have something, a blood pressure machine at home, that you bring it to the doctor's office or give or to a place where they could actually check the device for calibration, make sure that it's giving you an accurate reading. So I know people that actually will bring their blood pressure machine to the doctor's office take the blood pressure at the same time, see if they're coming up with a consistent type of result or not. If it's way off from what the doctor's office is getting or what another machine is getting, another device, you wanna make sure that your device isn't off. All right, so any questions about that? No? Okay, mm -hmm. feel free to stop me anytime if um, anybody has a question. And this is a chart here that just tells you about the blood pressure cuff size, all right? so. This will give you an idea of your arm circumference. So they're looking at your upper arm where they usually take the blood pressure. And um, this is how you know if um, you're having the, the right size or not. So there's different sizes and you just wanna pay attention to that. Gail, I have a question. Sure. This is Dawn um, from SAO. Um, does it matter um, if it's a cuff that goes around your upper arm or around your wrist? So that is a great question. Thanks for bringing that up because I get asked that a lot. Um, and I've asked this question too to the physicians that I work with. And the general thought is unless you have to take it on the wrist. So if you have an upper extremity, your upper arm, if it's if there's any sores there, if it's just painful for whatever reason and you can't have it on the cuff up in that area, if you've had a previous surgery, that type of thing, then you have to go to the wrist, then it's okay. But they typically do not recommend taking the blood pressure anywhere else aside from the upper arm unless you have to because the readings just aren't as accurate. The okay. wrist is Thank better you. than the leg, I've seen that too. Um, but um, typically something that you want to stay away from if you can avoid it. And often using the proper cuff size will let you take it in the upper arm. Okay, thank you. Sure, thanks for the question, Don. So these are just a couple of new stats um, and um, I'm not gonna really spend much time on these, but I did want to point out that um, when I started giving these talks back in 2005, stroke was actually the third leading cause of death at that point in time behind things, cardiovascular disease and, and cancer, that type of thing. It's now the fifth leading, leading cause of death. So we've done a better job at mortality, decreasing mortality, but um, 
it's still the number one in terms of disability. Yeah. So even though we've done a better job at preventing deaths, it's still the number one cause of disability there. And when you look at how many strokes happen, a stroke happens every three minutes and 17 seconds in the United States. Hmm. Very, very, very frequently. And they recommend now that we talked about the life's essential eight, screening for sleep. So for people that um, might snore, especially if they couldn't find a cause for your stroke, um, they have recently shown that sleep apnea is a contributing factor to causing strokes. Um, so something to pay attention to as well, and something that you might want to investigate if you do snore and you find that you're not getting a lot of sleep, you're being woken up a lot during your sleep and you feel tired every morning and there's no known reason for it. It's possible that you have sleep apnea. You want to definitely get that checked out. Mm -hmm. And the other thing they mention is um, my life check. So there's websites like the American Heart Association has like this that gives you a forum to actually go online and be able to enter information about your blood pressure, your glucose, your exercise level, that type of thing. And then what it does is it actually gives you a score. So this is mine. I got 85.6, one of the highest grades I've ever gotten. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, it's um, all to say that I was also kind of skeptical about going in and doing something like this. Um, I had, um, somebody from another support group um, that I run that didn't like the idea of entering their information on anything online. The thing that I like about this is it is from the American Heart Association. So you know that it's going to be more secure. You know that they're not going to be selling your information to anybody. It's purely meant to try to improve people's lifestyle. And what I found was even being skeptical, I found it really helped. So after, and I'm a professional, right? I talk about this all the time. I figured, what can you teach me that I don't know? But when you look at yourself, it's very different. So it really brought home to me the fact I knew I wasn't getting a ton of sleep during the week. Um, I was staying up late to get stuff done. Um, but when you really enter it into a computer a program like this, it really does bring home the fact of how little sleep you might be getting, or you don't, you're not eating as many green vegetables as you think you are. Um, that was definitely the case with me. So it tells you what you need to improve upon. And you can see here what I needed to improve upon. Um, Oops, sorry. And um, things that I was doing well, thankfully, that's there's more things that I was doing well than the things I need to improve upon. But it, it really does bring home the point of items that you need to work on that mm, you're kind of in the back of your mind, but it really brings it to the forefront that, yeah, you know, I really do need to work better on those things. So something I would definitely recommend. And then the nice thing about it is, one of the things on mine was I need to eat better. I definitely know that. I would eat at McDonald's every day if I could. Big <laughs> fan of their fries and the secret sauce. Um, I would eat there every day if it wasn't so bad for me. I know I need to change um, some of my eating habits, but it gives you a really nice outline here of those things you need to improve. You just click on it, and it gives you a nice little blurb of things that you can do to improve. In terms of cardiovascular risks, um, they said that um, it starts even in your 30s. So it's never too early to start thinking about this and making some lifestyle changes because what you do younger definitely does affect you as you get older. Um, don't forget your vitamins. So this is something too, there's an article that I presented to our support group as well that talked about the importance of vitamin D. So they actually have linked vitamin D deficiency to ischemic stroke risk. So that's something to really be mindful of um, and not just say, oh, it's all hogwash, um, something that you want to pay attention to. And I know we're running out of time. So um, 
I wanted to just mention COVID-19 and stroke was something I get asked a lot, a lot about. The, re the link there is they think a, a, coagulable, a coagulable state, but they're not really 100% sure about that, but they tend to see that a lot more in younger patients. They found without any risk factors. Um, but they did find that if you were fell into these categories here that you were more at risk of having COVID and a stroke. Mm -hmm. um, and then they did find, by the way, I thought this was noteworthy, that vaccines def did in decrease the risk of COVID. Um, and they also found that it decreased the risk of stroke as well. So I thought that was very interesting. Hmm. And then lastly, Be The Beat was just an initiative that they talked about that gets you to, and you guys seem like you're very music oriented. I, I love that. I think there's a place for music in everything. And what they have here is they wanna make sure that at least one person in every household is knowledgeable in CPR. And what they started to do was put things online, songs that actually replicate the rhythm that you need to go to. So I think Staying Alive was one of them um, from the Bee Gees. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that type of thing. The Shakira's Hips Don't Lie, I think, was on there. A lot of different songs like that um, to know that you're going to the, the beat and the proper rhythm. But what they were recommending was to make sure that at least one person um, in your household knows CPR so that they can share it with everybody. And God forbid anything happens, you'd have somebody there to be able to perform that. Um, so with that, I don't know if you guys are very strict at closing at seven, um, but I can definitely stay on if there's any other questions. Uh, what I would say, Gail, is let's let's do open it up to questions. I feel uh, bad. Uh, I I'll take responsibility of it. Um, our meetings are typically not not so elongated. Uh, we usually start right on time and we get after it, and and we're happy to do that. So. Uh, what you're doing here is great, though, and I would like to see if anybody has any questions. So um, can you um, get out of that screen or uh, and then we'll ask questions? I'm going to try, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, will, I will take partial responsibility, too, for definitely um, techie here. Stop share. All right. Oh, good job. All right. Woo -hoo. Uh, Michael. Yeah, uh, this is being a little bit skeptical. Uh, you know, they have shown that the number of stroke survivors are, I'm sorry, the number of strokes per year since 2013 is 780,000. I found that so skeptical that every year it is 780,000. Since I mean, for the last 10 years, I don't know where they come up with that number, but I found it not too realistic. Maybe it is, but what do you think? So I do a lot of these community talks and I, I um, mention often in some of them where we go on for longer and I present the stroke statistics. <laughs> the number um, of way back, and I can't remember exactly how far back that was, but it definitely um, several years ago, the number was in the 600,000. So it was when I started giving talks like this, it was 600 and something thousand. And now it's up to, like you said, 780, 785,000. I've even seen 795,000. So, and that's what they do. They update the stroke statistics typically every year, every couple of years to make sure they're getting those latest numbers out. And if so I, I can seen it move and I've seen it increase, unfortunately. I, and I'd like to make a comment on that too, Gail, if I can. So, um, you know, the American Heart Association and all these places and some of the I think that was who you were quoting on there. You know, there is a lot of redundancy, frankly, from my perspective. And so kind of going with what what Michael's saying, 
the other thing is they, they say, you know, 70% of all strokes are related to being obese or overweight or whatever. And I'm here to tell you that I have been doing this for years and I hardly ever get that. It, it's stroke is from all over the, the, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's all over the gambit and it can be anything. I know that that isn't easy to track and to put a statistic together, but I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, so I hear what you said about the numbers and I think you're right. I'm not arguing that, but I just think that it, it's something that we don't really have a good grip on yet. So, um, you know, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, and South Carolina, those four states are considered the stroke belt. Mm -hmm. And they don't really know why. They have a bunch of speculation, but they don't really know why. In North Carolina, strokes are two and a half times what it is in other states other than the stroke belt. And I think that's interesting, too. And anyway, I've been looking at these uh, stats um, going back as far as 2013. And you pin a lot of people down. They will finally come out and say, we don't really know. <laughs> so I think it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I applaud you actually for looking at the stat, those stats and for looking into some of that information because it's important. And um, you're absolutely right. There is a term for the stroke belt and I live in Florida and we're part of that, even though it's not as prevalent here in some of the other states that you mentioned, um, we do, we are affected um, similarly. So, and they do attribute that a lot to lifestyle, to eating habits, um, not as much exercise in some of those um, areas. And genetics does play a part as well. So that's a factor too. Angela, go ahead. Yes, um, first question is, Gail, are you from Canada? <laughs> I am, I've been here for 27 years. So I kept, I, I, I kept hearing in your voice, I'm going, is she from Canada? <laughs> but um, I had a question about the, um, the conference. Who goes to the conference? Who's invited to go to the conference? Is it nurses and doctors or who? Yeah, so this is a conference for professionals. So it's typically doctors, um, stroke coordinators like myself, researchers, nurses, um, people that are therapists that are in the healthcare field and um, that actually um, are involved with treating patients. But they have discussed opening certain, er certain things up to the community um, and they have not done so yet in this forum, but they do offer other things um, online through the American Stroke Association where you can, you can actually look at some of the articles that have been presented. Um, and what they do is uh, present synopsis on different days with some of the highlights. So even though if you can attend, you can still get some of that information mm -hmm. as a lead person and be able to be privy to some of that information. So Gail. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say that would be so awesome because um, I myself am always wanting to keep up on different research and things, recommendation and things that are going on in the stroke community, but or, or research, but I'm sure a lot of other people are as well. Yeah, and that's also, that's a great thing to be able to be up to date on because things are constantly changing. They do so much related to stroke on a regular basis, and there's always some late breaking research that they have. So I definitely encourage you to go on to the American Stroke Association website and look for, you can even Google International Stroke Conference 2023 and look for some of the highlights. Um, if you have any difficulty finding it, Keith has my contact information and he can certainly share it with you guys. 
so that you can email me. That's the best way typically so that I can um, forward you stuff more easily and um, be able to send you links if you want any of that. And I'd be happy to share some of those type of articles and that type of information with anybody. Thank you, Gail. And uh, Mark, you're coming up, buddy. Um, and thank you for hanging out for a few extra minutes. We, we really appreciate you for that. I wanted to make one more comment. And I, I know you guys probably get sick of hearing from me, but so uh, on some of these stroke coordination meetings, okay, and like the, the major stroke uh, meeting that you had, personally, I believe that they need to invite uh, some A or some stroke survivors who are in the know, who know what's going on, who talk to stroke survivors and warriors out there so that we can give them some of our input and they can hear our stories um, so that they can glean from that and get better at what they do. And, um, you know, twice I've been asked not to to join one that was here in Oregon. And I'm like, why are you not allowing somebody to come speak that had a stroke that understands? But I just wanted to point, I just wanted to put that little nugget in your brain. <laughs> That's so no, that, uh, great. Uh, great point, Keith. Go ahead, Gail. Uh, we hear, uh, we attend, uh, in my case, I have 10 different uh, support groups and I hear a lot of information and a lot of different type of functionality that stroke survivors go through. And when, no offense, Gail, uh, when you hear professionals speak, they don't seem to be as knowledgeable as we are. Absolutely. And I can tell you everything that you you all just said, excellent points. And in my hospital, we actually have a stroke survivor sit on our, our stroke leadership monthly meetings. So we have a community liaison for exactly the reasons you just mentioned. That's um, a great thing. It's too bad that you guys are in Oregon. Um, does anybody winter in Florida? Um, because we're actually looking for a new community liaison. It would be great to have one of you sit on our, our team. But um, that is something that we've had since our inception of being a stroke center back in 2005, um, because the people that actually put this together really did understand that. But you can't, you can't undermine um, the experience that you have and the knowledge that somebody who's been in this type of situation brings to the table compared to somebody, as you mentioned, like myself, who has experience through other people, but has not experienced themselves. It really does change things. Uh, real quick, I'm going to stop because Michael is out your way too. There's, there's people that we know that are out your way. So we'll uh, make sure that we put that out there. But before we do that, Mark, Mark had a question. I want to make sure Mark yeah. gets recognized. Thanks. Before I ask my question, uh, just uh, supporting the point you just made, Keith, uh, I did go uh, the last year. You know, last year I went to an aphasia conference, not a stroke stroke concert uh, conference, but obviously strong overlap. And they did invite uh, people with aphasia to the sessions and uh had them um they sort of made a session particularly highlighting the findings at the conference that the people in the local aphasia community really wanted to hear about cool. uh, which i thought was really great um my question for gail so i've read in a, some places that the incidence of stroke in younger people might be increasing recently or was that mentioned at all is that true do you know and whatever you know about that would be helpful yeah you guys are a really smart group um i love the fact that you're looking at all this stuff and that you're aware of a lot of the the latest things happening so yes they do talk about um strokes in younger people on the rise and 
they're not 100% sure. They're still looking at what the relationship is and why that might be happening. Um, we've actually created in our hospital a young support group because we saw the need for it. Unfortunately, there are so many more younger people having strokes that we created a whole different support group for them as a result. Um, they do talk about things like lifestyle um, and you know, a lot of people automatically think, oh, a young stroke, they must have been on drugs, that type of thing. That's very rarely the case. Mm -hmm. It often can be linked to high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, not going to the doctor, not exercising well. Um, I briefly mentioned the COVID link. So they did find that in younger patients. Um, a link that when people had COVID, they actually they also had a large vessel occlusion type of stroke. Um, mm. And those patients had no previous risk factors. So they're still looking into some of the causes of that. Um, but that is definitely something that they're paying more and more attention to because they do see that it's on the rise. Wow. Wow. Thank you very much. Um, sure. Michael, go. And then we got to start wrapping up, guys. Yeah, I've heard all this time. I am the founder of Believe Stroke Recovery Foundation. And last year, well, even this year, I should say, said, I should say of uh, the 18 people we are currently helping, five of them are under age 29. Oh, and my all of them have had strokes, and none of them are overweight. And it's uh, the youngest one is age 16. So uh, to Mark's point, I think uh, they, the statistic is that 38% of all strokes are increased at age 35 and below. Yeah, and there's different reasons for that, too. You can also get congen congenital malformations um, that sometimes don't manifest itself in their 20s and 30s, um, like a PFO, for instance, when there's uh, the hole in your heart that's normally there doesn't close at birth, like a few months after birth, like it normally should. Mm -hmm. So there's different um, things like that that um, we see in younger patients compared to older ones. Yeah. Put them more at risk. Well, uh, I'm going to uh, wrap this up, you guys, just because of timing. Uh, first of all, Gail, you know, thank you so much for a putting up with all the problems I we've had and and uh, staying with us. It it means a lot. It means the world to us. Um, we appreciate you so much, and you did a great job. And so everybody, make sure we let her know that. And, um, and Gail, you and I will touch base. And uh, if you're okay with it, I will share your email. Um, if that's okay. Uh, yes, please do. Especially, I apologize again. I appreciate you guys bearing with me, working out all the technical difficulties. And you guys are such a great group. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here. And I appreciate you setting this up, Keith. Thank you so much for that and for all that you do. And oh, um, we would be happy to answer any other questions if you guys have them. All right, one quick, one more quick thing. Are there any stroke adversaries this month? June, no? Oh, wow. John? John had a stroke adversary. <laughs> yeah, you go, buddy. Well, because of time, we'll wrap up. I uh, appreciate each and every one of you guys and we appreciate Gail for coming on. And listen, uh, they're going to be, you know, we've got a lot of recordings and stuff. If anybody wants anything, reach out to me. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. And off we go, right? Thanks, Keith. See you next week. See you, Keith. Bye. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Have a great day. You too. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.